Good morning. So uh, I'm Mark Dotson. I'm the uh, trade out capability manager for electronic warfare, or as I've been told recently, I'm just the capability manager for electronic warfare as we decide whether we're really trade off or Army Futures Command and how we're going to work all that, all that out. Um, so welcome to a Thursday morning brief, and I can see that we've got a lot of people still taking stuff down outside. So a um, little bit smaller group, but I'm okay with that. Uh, this is also the brief that almost didn't happen. Uh, I got a call last week um, on Thursday that my slides weren't in, and so I couldn't brief. And I said, well, I, I told you all months ago that I'm not going to use slides. I said, well, you can't brief if you don't have slides. I said, well, that doesn't make sense. So we go through the process of figuring out why can't I brief if I don't have slides. And we have rules. That's exactly right. Well, and the rule in the <laughs> and it's the process. And the rule in this case was you can't brief because we haven't approved the slides. And if we can't approve your slides, you can't brief. And so that was uh, so we created a slide, and I have it here. It's right here. We sent it in. We submitted it, and we didn't make it here. So. So I get my wish, and, uh, and it is approved by, by the G2 to, to, be, uh, to, to talk about. A couple things I wanted to hit off the, uh, off the get-go uh, to kind of set the, uh, the stage. Um, I consistently get a question on what's SIGINT, what's cyber, what's electronic warfare, how do you know the difference, who does what? Uh, so I can explain... Uh, a little bit about what we are and what we're not. So electronic warfare is what the signal is, where it's coming from, what it's being used for, and um, we're using that information, what we discover about the signal, we're going to use for targeting. We're using it for immediate ac activities. Uh, where we draw a definite line with the intel community is only we can look at blue force signals. Only we can look at friendly signals and go, hey, this is what the, our, our command post looks like. And so that's, that's electronic warfare. From the SIGINT perspective, there are two things uh, that we can absolutely not do uh, by our rules. And that one is we cannot decrypt and we cannot uh, look at the internals of the signal. We can demodulate from an electronic warfare perspective, but we cannot look at the internals. That defines the SIGINT side of the house. When we talk about cyber, especially RF-enabled cyber, uh, we can be a delivery means for, for cyber. Uh, we can provide a pathway for them. Where we also have the ability to manipulate the signal. As long as we are manipulating the signal, while it's still a signal, that's electronic warfare. If there is anything done within that signal that once it is received causes an action to occur at the far end on software or hardware, that's cyber. So manipulation of the signal, still okay, but if it happens at the far end, if something occurs, if we're causing an activity to occur at the far end as a result of what's going through the EMS, then that is a, then that, that kind of falls onto cyber. I uh, also wanted to provide a, uh, a couple updates. One, we recently had a, uh, a scrum with, uh, with General Fogarty. And basically what that was was getting a whole bunch of the, the electronic warfare expertise from the NCOs and the, the warrant officer cadres that we have and start the process of getting them much more involved in the requirements process. Up to this point, what's happened is we've developed requirements and we send them over to uh, the appropriate staffing locations. So you send it out to Forces Command and you send it out to, to TRADOC and you send it out to AFC, over to the PM shop, and everybody takes a look at it and sends it back to you. What we weren't guaranteeing was that we were getting down to the soldier level for feedback on the requirements. 
And as that translated over onto the onto uh, QRCs, which is mostly what we have right now, quick reaction um, capabilities, those QRCs weren't reflecting necessarily what soldiers needed either until after the fact, and then we would iterate them. And so uh, we have Chief Cardenas here uh, from the schoolhouse, um, and he was he was a key member uh, of that scrum, and he's going to be one of the, the heavy lifters in ensuring that we incorporate that, that feedback. So I wanted to make sure to, to call him out so y'all y'all know he's here. Um, he and I actually started this a, a little bit early. We went to uh, to Suffolk together uh, because we wanted to make sure that. I'm a, I'm a tanker by trade. I've got four years of electronic warfare, and it's all here. It's a ticket. So um, my level of expertise is a mile wide but an inch deep. I can talk for about 15 seconds on everything. Please go ahead. So the, technically that falls under, the, under information, uh, but in terms of building the capabilities, if they are in the spectrum, so say I want to, um, uh, to present, then I, we see that as, as uh, electronic warfare. Uh, and and that, that may change over time, but right now the, the ball hasn't been had not been taken. Uh, and General Fogarty pointed at me and said, "This is part of counter targeting, uh, so we have the ball." And, and feel free to just raise your hand. I, I, I don't. You're all stuck in here. If you want your credit, you're stuck in here for an hour. So <laughs> um, I don't see anybody who looks like they're really here for the credit, though. So. Um, all right, uh, so bring the, the users back into it, uh, going to, go to Sophic with, uh, with Chief to ensure that we're getting the education and the experience uh, melded into what's going on with, with me uh, and my shop. And my shop, if you all raise your hands around here. Uh, so I do have a, a lot of expertise in my shop from the Navy, Marine Corps, uh, Army folks, uh, some retired, still active duty. Uh, there's a lot of experience there, but way too much for me to absorb and, uh, and, and, and provide expertise on all the way. Um, they're also, uh, really what we're talking about today is primarily going to be on the uh, demonstration, experimentation, and prototype, what that means to the Army and what that potentially means to, to industry. And this started with, with the, uh, the terrestrial layer system, TLS. Uh, as we moved forward with what was then known as MSU Ground and MIM-3 from the Intel community, we saw that we had about an 85% overlap. The uh, Chief of Staff said, hey, this, this overlap is too much. It should be one capability. So we moved forward with what's now known as a terrestrial layer system. One capability integrated for signals intelligence and electronic warfare. The chief staff further directed that we had to integrate cyber capabilities into, uh, into the vehicle. Since, it's our, since it transmits through the RF or through the spectrum, it, it makes perfect sense. We have that ability. It's just some, some minor modifications to, to ensure that that, can, uh, that that can happen. As we move further down the line, we realize that if we have the ability to transmit, uh, why just transmit white noise when we could be part of the information, uh, information operations and actually transmit messages? And again, very, very small tweaks to our requirement and we've now begun to incorporate uh, information operations uh, onto the system as well. Uh, we wanted to accelerate the, uh, the fielding of a system for the Army because we had a force that was being generated. The Army recognized the need for electronic warfare operators, and we didn't have the equipment 
for them coming out of the pipeline. So we were directed to move as quickly as possible to use uh, IT box type solutions, but those only apply to IT. So how do we take, how do, how do we accelerate? Uh, we looked at, uh, at our normal processes and said that we, they, they were not acceptable going through a traditional AOA 18 months to two years, an analysis of alternatives in order to be able at the end to tell us something that we already knew, that we need a truck that has our, our system with, with two trucks that has the ability to do signals intelligence, electronic warfare, and cyber. So we came up with a demonstration, experimentation, and prototyping. And the idea was take the current QRCs, take them out to the field, have soldiers get on them, test them, run, run exercises with them, uh, and give us feedback so that we can build a requirement more quickly without the use or with validating uh, analysis of alternatives as, as we move forward. Great, uh, a, a lot of learning uh, along the way. Um, but just from a tactical operation, you don't get the repetition that you need. Because you bring a truck or trucks to a unit. Uh, generally, we've been developing these as rapidly as we can, so they arrive within weeks or occasionally a month out from, the, uh, from a training event, from the first training event, because we are leaving the equipment with the same unit. And then they roll out. Uh, the soldiers aren't fully, have not fully integrated uh, the equipment into how they're going to operate. The command hasn't fully integrated. So uh, then you get out to the field and you do one or two iterations because that's how many operations you have. And we come back and we gather as much data as we can off of that, but it's not enough to really get the sets and reps we need. And so that's when modeling and simulation come in, comes in. And so we have uh, Colonel Rill back there from our cyber battle lab. And he's working with the Intelligence Battle Lab over at uh, Huachuca to be able to provide those sets and reps. Uh, and then all through this process, uh, we have Colonel Finch also sitting back there. He's our PM. He's also responsible for all the QRCs that are being fielded for electronic warfare. So all of the, he is from the get-go looking at the requirement that we're building and helping shape it uh, with the QRCs and uh, and helping us to understand what the realities are. We are constantly out with industry as well, trying to figure out what we can, uh, where we can push the envelope so that we're getting the best capability with the first iteration. What's a little bit different about uh, not having a traditional analysis of alternatives is that there is no end date to demonstration, exper experimentation, and prototyping. So when the first trucks roll off uh, for TLS, we will still have opportunities to iterate and ensure that, that we are getting a better system every time that we get a new truck that rolls out. We're also looking at uh, using open architecture. Uh, and there's a, a, a definition paper that came out at the end of June uh, that defines what open architecture is from the... Uh, Program Manager, Electronic Warfare, and Cyber uh, Perspective. And so that's, that's our open architecture that we're using as the basis for uh, the terrestrial layer system. That's what uh, demonstration, experimentation, and prototyping means to the Army. What does it mean to industry? Uh, it means there's not going to be a huge program uh, where you get one large contract for six or seven hundred million dollars and you're going to field everything for the army all, all at once. It means that the uh, that there are going to be opportunities for you to demonstrate pieces of the product that can integrate into a whole, integrate into the terrestrial layer system or integrate into the other requirements that I'll, that I'll discuss here in a minute. Uh, it means that you have to hunt for those opportunities such as CyberQuest, CyberBlitz, the burn-offs, because that's where we're going to see where we, the, the, the requirements community, are going to have the opportunity to see the equipment being used. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Kevin, but I think it's still the view of the, uh, of the acquisition side of the house that 
we don't want to see PowerPoint. We want to see what you can do now. Right. So it's what can you show me today that you can that you can do rather than telling me what you can do for me in about five years. From a requirements perspective, that means we're writing to today's technology for the threshold. The objective, we're putting the sky's the limit so we don't have to come back and rewrite requirements. In the past, that would have been iffy because it's easy for the acquisition community to turn around and go, ah, we met threshold and we're good. But we've built that trust over years uh, to where the understanding is as the system goes through and gets approved from the uh, requirements perspective on the acquisition side, they know they're shooting for objective within the funding parameters that they have. So um, looking for those opportunities to be able to show your equipment. And if, if we don't have the right venue, then you should be beating down the PM's door, beating down my door, beating down the Cyber Battle Lab's door for what is the venue. Please. So the terrestrial layer system itself doesn't exist yet. It's still, uh, we haven't even finalized the requirement on it yet. Um, but as we iterate through the QRCs, uh, the equipment that's being used uh, informs what we're writing. It informs what we're writing in three ways. It informs us from a, uh, an organizational standpoint, how, we, how, how many of the systems do we need? Uh, where, at what echelon should they be? Um, how do they maneuver? And under, who do they, under whom should they maneuver? It informs us from a material standpoint, what are, our, uh, what are the capabilities that we want? How long do we, how far out do we have to reach? How far out do we have to sense? And tied to that is one of the capabilities that uh, USERA really brought to the front was you have to bake into the system as it comes on the ability to work with your partners. And so uh, part of the networking process that we're going through is which one of the networks that comes into the, into the vehicle are we going to be able to share on so that, so that the information can be shared. In terms of the, uh, what we're calling the pre-prototypes, so those items that are not technically prototypes for the terrestrial layer system, but uh, they are informative, uh, whether they be on Striker, uh, whether it's the EWTV, the Electronic Warfare uh, Tactical Vehicle, the Tactical Electronic Warfare System, the Tactical SIGINT System. All those are informative. Um, some of those have been deployed to Europe, and so we are taking a look at how to integrate with, uh, with partners. Um, particularly next year will be another, uh, another great event uh, to be able to take uh, a look at uh, Defender 20 and uh, get with our partners and see how much, how can we share and um, what, do, what changes do we have to make to the requirement to ensure that we can facilitate that. So um, that's a lot about, a lot about TLS, uh, but there are other requirements out there for electronic warfare. Uh, the main tool that we have that's going to help us operate through, uh, through all these environments and, and with all these tools is the Electronic Warfare Planning and Management Tool. And uh, in its current instantiation, uh, we're, it's an IT box solution. And we are iterating. We have, uh, we're complete with Capability Drop 2. I think Capability Drop 3 is coming online uh, soon. And Capability Drop 4 within the next 18 months or so. Uh, what that will provide is the ability for electronic warfare soldiers to visualize the environment, show their commanders what the environment looks like, and also to be able to uh, dynamically retask uh, systems out in the field. Um, it'll provide a mod and sim capability. It'll provide a um, spectrum management capability as well. 
that's kind of the baseline for, uh, for, the, for the management aspect of electronic warfare tools. We have uh, multi-function electronic warfare air tools. We have three of them planned, potentially more. Uh, those are uh, the first one that's a program of record is multi-function electronic warfare air large. Uh, it's gray eagle based. Uh, we're still working through uh, prototypes on surrogates, uh, but it'll get fielded out to the cabs uh, for a reinforcement capability to the BCTs, uh, but it'll be a, a division tool pushed down to the BCTs. We're looking at a small capability, which would be think um, something on a uh, on a shadow. Uh, we're still kind of in the, in the in the learning phase of whether we need to be on the shadow as a limited capability now, or should we fully integrate with FTUAS as that moves forward? And so we're we're still on the on the edge. We're writing the requirement, um, and the platform is not really uh, the Tickums problem, but we're making it our problem so that we don't. Uh, either create a system that's not useful by the time it's fielded because we, we eventually um, twilight the shadow system or um, we're putting ourselves on a platform uh, or we're taking too long to get to the, the next platform. So we want to reach a balance where we're providing capability now to the brigade commander but also uh, integrating fully into the future. And then we have a rotary wing capability that we're looking at that uh, we don't have uh, fully developed. We think initially uh, what, the, what the aviation community has right now is a system that's very much like the, those alarm commercials. You know, hey, you're being robbed. Well, what are you doing about it? <clears throat> Nothing. I, I just told you you're being robbed. And it's very similar with, with our aviators. It's, hey, somebody's getting ready to shoot at you, but there's nothing they can do to, to respond. And so the first rotary wing capability that we have to provide is going to be something that's going to uh, be able to assist uh, the aviation community with survivability of the aircraft, and we'll grow from there uh, for the uh, electronic warfare-specific capabilities. Please. No, no, please, anytime. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I'll let Kevin take that question because... So, uh, so anyways, uh, so I, I, before, I'm coming to finish on the PM for electronic warfare and cyber. So before I took off, I, uh, I went to my, my PM who runs EWPMT, and I'm like, give me a stack of your cards because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure everybody knows how to get the SDK for EWPMT. So come see me afterwards. Actually, I'll, I'll give you one right now, but if somebody else uh, uh, from a co company who has a sensor who needs to integrate with EWPMT, come please see me. I will give you one of his cards so you can uh, reach out. Uh, there's a form you have to fill out uh, to, to get it, but it's uh, it's pretty painless. Uh, during CyberQuest, we had a total man uh, – actually, no, man, uh, I think we integrated four or five se different sensors at, at CyberQuest. So, we're refining the process to make sure that it's more user-friendly to the businesses to integrate into EWPMT. So, I mean, that's going to be a program record. I, I told my, my goal is is by uh, uh, you know this this year is the when I get around to vendors is to see hey we're integrated with EWPMT. I, I don't want to see Raptor X anywhere. Uh, that's kind of that's kind of my goal moving forward. But um, yeah, come, I'll give it to you right now. And uh, anybody else come come see me after and I'll get you it. Thank you. Does that answer your question? <laughs> so, uh, I'll continue with the uh, a, a little bit. I, I touched on the on the aviation aspect, um, but really, uh, what's required for us to deal with anything on the rotor ring system, or, and the uh, the small capability, is very close integration with the aviation center, so the aviation center of excellence, because we want to ensure that that uh, whatever we do is fully integrated with what they're doing. 
but they, they have the lead on how they want us to go about that, whether they write a requirement or whether we write a requirement and that they take it through or whether we take it through, uh, all that. We just, we just want to make sure that we're very close co closely coordinated with the Aviation Center. I already mentioned that we're integrated with the um, Intelligence Center. We also integrate with the Fire Center because they have the counter UAS mission, uh, a, a portion of which involves the spectrum. Uh, the, we also integrate with the Maneuver uh, Center, and that kind of takes us to our terrestrial layer systems. Um, we're closely tied, particularly with respect to how we're going to go about doing uh, the terrestrial layer system small. Uh, so small, you know, we don't have a future, uh, an extended future for the current protection systems for vehicles. So the Maneuver Center is working on how they're going to protect those systems protect vehicles. We are also looking at that. And so we are assisting as they build their requirement. Uh, and then at the end, we're going to determine whether that meets our requirement or whether we have to have something additional out there uh, to provide a greater capability. The idea behind the system is that it would be counter, uh, counter your traditional IEDs, but also anything that uses the spectrum for targeting. So think precision guided munitions, et cetera. In terms of um, the uh, manning for that, that's very much like the Crew Duke system of today. It's something that you would put on the vehicle, hopefully in a much smaller form factor. Um, for folks who have been on those trucks, they're not very comfortable. Uh, but it would be essentially fire and forget. The, uh, the EWO would program it, or it could be remotely programmed through EWPMT and the truck rolls out, it's not the operator of the vehicle who has to worry about it. Please? No. Um, You're going to help it go now or so. <laughs> uh, so the, the short answer is I don't know. Um, we haven't run enough. To, uh, our first concentration for modeling and simulation is going to be on the terrestrial layer system large. So when we talk to small system, uh, we've got to figure out, first of all, how the, how the end state requirement looks for the maneuver center. And then what vehicles is that, going to, or is that requirement going to go on from, a, from the maneuver standpoint? Take a look at how that plays out in mod and sim and out at the CTCs, et cetera, then turn around and revisit our requirements and say, okay, how many more would be required in order to completely fill or to come as close to, to filling the gap as we can uh, for, to protect all vehicles or all convoys? And again, if, a, if one system can protect an entire convoy, then no, we don't need it on every truck. So, so we're still working through that, still in very nascent stages. Um, <clears throat> so the large system that I just mentioned, uh, that's the one that we, we've started down the, the trail of uh, uh, demonstration, experimentation, prototyping with. But all of these will be revisited through demonstration, experimentation, and prototype. That's how we're going to move forward with, with, these, with, these, uh, with these programs. Uh, individual protective system, I uh, think a, uh, either fully integrated at its final state into the squad radio, or until then, something that you could slap onto your radio that would provide a measure of protection for the soldiers. Uh, again, not something that they have to man, uh, but something that's programmed for them and can provide some uh, electronic attack capability potentially, um, but really for the protection of soldiers as they, as they move around dismounted on the, on the battlefield. Um, the, uh, the idea behind that one was that we had tools uh, that could produce, that could do electronic attack, that could uh, do some counter UAS missions for the soldiers. We provided them to infantry squads, and we soon found that as they maneuvered around the battlefield, as soon as they made contact, it became a burden for them because there's no immediate feedback uh, of what they're, what they're accomplishing. 
and it's affecting the mission because it's a squad member who's out of the net because he's doing electronic electronic warfare. With uh, and, and so we've taken that tool and put it back onto the vehicles as a dismounted capability. Uh, but that will be manned by electronic warfare folks if it gets pushed forward or, or signatures. And as it gets pushed forward, it goes forward with a signature or with an electronic warfare uh, person uh, to assist. And then um, we have a, uh, the extended range capability. The extended range capability is really where I think we're uh, going to come into uh, EW, EW's own. And uh, that's the reason I kept it for last because I wanted to spend the most time on it. So when you heard General Fogarty talk, uh, he talked about um, the ability to, to provide greater capability to the commander. So extended range, ER, TLS ER, is not just extended range in terms of distance. It's an extended range of capabilities for the commander. Key among those capabilities is going to be the ability to, to conduct counter-targeting. Uh, you've perhaps heard uh, General Fogarty talk about uh, how when he wants the ability to have a column of tanks that moves along uh, an avenue of approach and it makes a right turn, but every tank drops off a robot that makes a left turn. Tank column goes silent, goes radio silence, but the, the robots keep transmitting. And so that's part of the part of deception out there to address something you brought up. Um, that's a very simple example. So the example that I like to use, uh, because it incorporates what I think would be the vast majority of the capabilities that we'd need in the deception realm, and this would probably be held at the, the division or the core level, would be something to support an air assault. So as you conduct an air assault, you're going to have uh, false insertions. You're going to have one target area and potentially two or three other areas, at least one, where you're going to pretend to insert folks, uh, but you're not, and then you're going to move over to, to where you actually put your people down. Uh, but you want to pretend that you were there, and you've got to be really convincing because you have to get into the enemy. You have to get the enemy to commit one way or to fail to commit so that you have the time to reinforce your first lift in. So imagine, if you will, the first rounds of artillery that go in for seed. Inside that seed are little EW pods that once they land, start transmitting very low, uh, but something similar to what you would hear from a LERSH unit. So after the seed comes in, then you start hearing the reports of whether there's effects that have happened, and the enemy picks up on that. But now he has someone who's live over here transmitting and little pods that landed that are also transmitting. We're now... We've now caused him to think a little bit about, wait, now I don't know where, I, I can't commit yet to where, the, to where the, uh, the force is coming in. As we conduct the false insertion, uh, the helicopters kick off a box that, looks like a, that, that sounds like a CP, a command post. And they kick off some, some robots or throwbots. And each one of those has either a squad radio or a platoon radio on it. And those start moving out. So now, once again, the enemy is looking at what they see in the spectrum. Now they not only have emanations that are stationary, but they have something mobile. And so what they're really looking for now is, okay, can I commit yet to where, to where they've actually landed forces? And then you can add on from there. You could have, if once the, once the force is on the ground, they're going to need fire support, and a lot of that fire support is going to come from the aviation community as well in the form of Apaches. We could have quadcopters that emanate similar to Apaches. It's a little bit, a little bit further stretched uh, because that's also a much easier visual for folks to identify, and that would, that would be a clue that, hey, that's not the right place to go. Um, but something along those lines. And the reason I use that example is because it uses so many different tools for, um, for deception. Those same robots could be the robots that you kick off a tank that go a different direction. Those uh, artillery shells that you send down range uh, that transmit like their little, like their little radios uh, could also be used if you get them close enough for stand-in jamming. 
They could be used as retranspods. Um, they could be used for sensing. The, uh, the CP box that you kick out to simulate where the assault CP would be. Well, that's the same box that you could use to put three or four behind friendly lines to try to convince the enemy that, hey, we don't have one CP or you don't know where our CP is because we've got four boxes that are emanating as well as a CP. And so that's the idea behind extended range in terms of the, um, the deception capabilities. Extended range also has two other capabilities. Please. It is both. And then, so I'm going to hit the second, the second and third capabilities that we see from extended range. So it's really extended range of capabilities, uh, not, not just distance-wise. Uh, so the other two aspects are, um, so that's deception. The other two aspects are providing long-range sensing and long-range attack, which is what you're talking about, the more power, uh, greater sensing. What we're really looking for, though, is do we need to have the attack from the same location we are sensing? So perhaps the, uh, the altitude for the sensor could be at a uh, uh, behind friendly lines, uh, far behind friendly lines, and because we have greater altitude, we have the sensing capability, but that's not the same area we want to transmit from because it's going to take an overwhelming amount of power to be able to have an effect. So your transmit capability would be forward, whether it's artillery delivered, whether it's truck delivered, or whether it's a different truck that's tied to that sensor uh, so that you get, gain the, uh, the electromagnetic advantage by being closer. So those are the things that we're looking at in terms of the, uh, um, the long-range sensing and attack. And then the final is the, uh, is the defensive electronic attack, and that's how do we protect our command posts? How do we protect those mission essential value areas, the MEVAs? And so that would be uh, something along the lines uh, of, a, uh, um, of a crude duke system. I hesitate to use that term because it's so limited in its capabilities. Um, but something along those lines, much greater capability uh, to, protect, to protect our, uh, our CPs uh, from, from activities in the electromagnetic spectrum. So that's where extended range kind of falls. And so at this point, I'm kind of pause and see what, what questions you all have, and uh, we can go from there. Please, sir. Absolutely. So we actually have, uh, from my shop, a permanent LNO stationed at, uh, at the Aviation Center. Uh, it's Major Nike, right? And um, Josh, yeah. And uh, he continuously loops us back in to, uh, to what the aviation community is up to, and we're looping them in to, to what we're up to. Um, we haven't gotten to the point where we have to determine whether we're integrating into what they're doing or whether we're going to go separate routes. Um, but we have that constant communication going back and forth. Yes. Please.
So for the deception capabilities, uh, we're looking at some of these things are very high TRL. Uh, so we are, they're things that we could buy, almost buy commercially off the shelf, or that will require very little in terms of integration. Uh, the trick now is getting the requirement validated or getting rdt and &E funding uh, so that we can continue uh, iterating on those until we can uh, come up with the exact requirement that we want. In terms of a timeline, uh, we could see uh, some of those come out, uh, some of the deception capabilities come out within the next two to three years from a experimental um, uh, experimental capabilities that would be out there. Fielding, of course, would be based off of those results. For a terrestrial layer uh, large system, uh, we're looking in the 2022-2023 uh, having some prototypes that are out, but different than in the past where you take a prototype and you run it through uh, a range at some separate location, the prototypes for these systems are going to actual units as part of demonstration experimentation prototype. It continues to iterate. So the first ones that roll off aren't going to go be used at, uh, for, for testing without soldiers. They're actually going to have soldiers on them at a unit uh, to be able to do that. Uh, Infu error uh, large is already in prototyping. Um, for the aviation systems, it requires us, uh, it's going to require senior leaders to, uh, to take a look at um, whether the need now at the BCT is such that it preempts the value of waiting for full integration and doing one requirement only as we move forward with FTUAS. Correct. <laughs> Sir. So, absolutely, and I think um, I have mentioned Kruduk in here a couple times. Uh, so the strategy of the, of the past was uh, the Iwo stays on staff because he's really a guy who's taking care of protecting you from IEDs. And that's how the EW Corps started up again after our split from, uh, from, from the signals intelligence community. Um, as we started looking at our near peers, we realized that we were woefully behind on any other electronic warfare capabilities, be it sensing, uh, be it protection, or be it electronic attack. Uh, the Army immediately started looking at how they can accelerate getting a, an operational capability out to the field. And that operational capability first came, uh, and this was a little bit, a, a little bit uh, backwards, but the first thing that came was the ability to get the people uh, in, in slots so that we could say, hey, between 19 and 22, we're going to start fielding the platoons at the BCT level so that we can provide, it was called fixing broken icons. And it was give the capability back to the brigade commander uh, so that he has the ability to, to fight a near peer. And that's where, that's where we started. And we're plugging in all our equipment to synchronize it with the delivery of those, uh, of those soldiers. Please. So there, there's some, and so it depends on what the sensor is, right? So um, I'll give you the example for like EWPMT, for instance. Um, 
we've already used EWPMT in a different format. And so, you know, uh, Colonel Dotson talked about the QRC capabilities, and, and one of the QRC capabilities that we, we made to help, uh, that's helped to inform it is a, a called Ravenclaw, which is a, a different version of EWPMT. So, you know, and, it, and I'll tell you, this has been a big success story because uh, with, that, with those QRCs, we've been getting all kinds of feedback from the field. But one of the unique items about that particular QRC is it was the ability to command and control the sensors. So actually, if you go and look at Saber Fury, for instance, it's actually the user interface for, for that platform. We kind of envision that happening as well for a lot of these other platforms uh, that, you know, like obviously, um, you know, we're not going to have somebody sitting on top of a gray eagle commanding and controlling the pod. Um, so, so in this case, you know, we'd have to have an interface that, that commands and controls that. So, yes, yeah, so I, I would see that being the mechanism of tasking that that particular platform uh, in, in the future, or something, or some sort of middleware or something to do that. But, but yes, um, we do have visions of that of that occurring. Does that answer your question? So a couple things that I want to that I brought up at the beginning, but that I want to make sure that I reiterate as we as we take a look and start winding down the time here. Um, first is that everything, every product that we're looking at, we're trying to figure out what the best way to integrate signals intelligence, electronic warfare, cyber operations, and also I/O into that system is. If it doesn't apply, we just need to ensure that we understand why it doesn't apply. But the first default is always going to be. How do we work all those into it? Um, and if the expense, sorry, go ahead. Actually, as I sat back down, I was like, okay, I've got to complete my thought here. Um, so, so you're going to have different variations of sensors that are out on, on that are going to be uh, sensing the EMS. Some of these are going to be manned, and some of these are not going to be unmanned. Um, in, in the situations where uh, the, you know, the user interface is going to be supporting, in this case, SIGINT, EW, and cyber. Uh, EW, PMT might not be the, r the right choice for the user interface for that particular platform. However, EW, PMT will definitely have a mechanism of providing information back to the, to the, uh, to the commander to update the cop. So that way he has understanding of what's going on from the lobs and geo side of the house and then also being able to make a decision on, hey, here's – Here's the enemy order of battle in the electronic uh, in, in the spectrum, and, and as they get that, you know, ideally, as we move forward with our next capability drop, uh, you have you'll have the 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 enemy order of battle in in this in this system overlaid, and as they start seeing specific signals of interest that would that we have associated with those types of units. We'll be able to start going. Hey, this is where we believe this particular type of unit is, uh, and then be able to then pass that information back, uh, and then ideally go all the way from sensor to shooter uh, uh, to do that. And, and actually, we were very successful with that at CyberQuest. They, we had a, a sensor that we put out there, and all the way from sensor all the way to AFAT, as they're able to generate a fire mission. So. I mean, that's the goal that we have is to make sure that we have that the ability for the system to communicate all the way back. Uh, but some systems, you know, like TLS, for instance, are, are, are is EWPMT going to be the user interface for that? Mm, pro probably not. Um, however, it's definitely going to be able to get tasks from the higher headquarters and then pass that information off to, to TLS so then the operators on the system can, can action that. But EWPMT is definitely going to be involved because it's going to be the mechanism of getting information back uh, to the brigade and higher echelons to show them what the, what, what's going on in the EMS. So I mentioned the, the integration part is one of the parts I wanted to, to bring back up at the end. And the second is that uh, – Demonstration, experimentation, and prototyping can't occur in a vacuum. It's not like the Tickum here sits and goes, hey, we're going to go, go forward and do this. It requires funding, and so we get the funding from, from, from DA. But it also requires the participation of everyone in the Army who's involved in the acquisition process or the requirements process wanting things to go faster. So when you take a look at uh, the PM who's sitting with us in this room today as we're talking about requirements, He's also got his folks and my folks working together out on the QRCs trying to figure out what does this mean to our future requirement. Simultaneously, you have the folks from ATEC 
who are required to, to go forth and test our equipment at the end, they're out at all these exercises as well, trying to find the way, hey, what's the best way to test this? How can we reduce our testing time? What items will we not have to test because we're going to have operational tests on? Uh, we've got the schoolhouse involved, taking a look at, hey, as this thing comes online, what's the training that's going to be required? And all of this is occurring simultaneously. So it's, it's, a, it's a very challenging endeavor, um, but a lot of really good folks are working on it, and, uh, and we think we're going to be able to get a, a great capability for the Army. So with that, I'm done, but I'll take any more questions. Please, sir. Okay, so um, the Army actually put, put some thought into this. And uh, what we had uh, for, for a while, and this is just Mark speaking, uh, we had kind of divested ourselves from true spectrum management. And we did exactly what you're talking about, spectrum deconfliction. I've got 10 frequencies. <clears throat> I've got 10 units. I'll give each unit one frequency. Uh, and that way I'm safe. Uh, when we talk spectrum management, we've brought a spectrum, manager, uh, a spectrum manager into the SEMA cell as a direct link back to the six. And we also have six representation who's closely tied in with the, with the SEMA section. So that as we look dynamically at what's happening on the battlefield, we're being jammed on frequency one. Well, I've got to put that person on another frequency, but I already allocated my 10 frequencies. Well, instead of doing that, you look at how you can, well, I've got a hill here, so I could allocate the same frequency to two different units. And that's that guy's job is to figure out how do I gain maneuver space in the electromagnetic spectrum. And so that spectrum manager who resides within the SEMA section is the one who has visibility on what's going on on the signal side, what's going on on the electronic attack side as well. Now, that also ties back into, once again, integration with the intelligence community, what are they trying to find out about the spectrum that, we don't, that, that, that we're not tracking currently? So that's why we tie this. The SEMA section is also tied into the, to the intel folks so that as a signal comes in or as we want to do an activity, that manager can go, hey, it's not affecting anything that 6 is doing, and the 2 is not collecting on any of those frequencies, so we can go ahead and execute. Or, sir, we need to deconflict with this guy over here because they're doing something on that frequency that, that we shouldn't be messing around with. So it's taking spectrum management, uh, in addition to having it on the sixth side, also having it in the SEMA section where, uh, where they're taking a, a holistic look at the spectrum. Sir? He absolutely is. It, it is the actually... Uh, Electronic Warfare Planning and Management Tool actually has the first spectrum management tool that is a program of record for the Army. The Army has programs that they're using, uh, but none of those are programs of record. So EWPMZ's first spectrum management program of record. And that'll hit capability drop two, but we think we pushed it to three. Is that right? So. In FY20. So there you go. Sir? So there's not a cross-functional team specifically for, uh, um, for electronic warfare uh, or for intelligence. Um, but a lot of the work that we do falls under APNT, and so we, we work with them or for, for some things. Uh, the other thing is that we do have the uh, Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance Task Force, uh, which is kind of like a pseudo, um, uh, a pseudo CFT. And we've been able to use that uh, under the G2 and G3 to, to, move, um, to move the interests of, of integrated signals intelligence, electronic warfare, and cyber forward. Uh, in terms of modernization priorities, we fall under uh, soldier survivability, or I'm sorry, soldier lethality and long-range precision fires. So our sensing capability for long-range precision fires, and then uh, soldier lethality by 
muting the radios, we give the soldiers additional capability to, to kill. All right. Pending any other questions, I think uh, anyone? All right. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it.